All right, welcome. Hey, how's everybody doing today? This is the Genesee County Compassion Club show coming to you live from allpointstv.com. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at All Points TV. We'll be talking about medical marijuana here in Michigan and also what's going down at the Genesee County Compassion Club. I want to say hello to all our members out there. How you doing, everybody? It's a beautiful day. It's cold back here in Michigan again. And, uh, you know, winter is finally here. I, I mean, it's just been uh, one of those weird winters, and I guess it hasn't been that bad. I know a lot of folks don't like the snow, but uh, it's here, and uh, I'm, I'm happy about it, man. I like the snow. Anyways, uh, it's brand new year's 2016. Glad to be back in the studio. Got John here with me, keeping it down at All Points TV. Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> Still here. Uh, hey, I just want to let you guys know what's been happening down at the club. We've had a lot of exciting events uh, that have been going on. If you've missed out, I'm sorry for you, but uh, there's always more coming. We had this this last weekend. Our uh, this is our charity event that we helped out with. It was the Humane Society, Genesee County Humane Society, and we did the uh, pins for puppies. I think that's what it's called, or bowling for bowling for dogs bowling for animals anyways we went down to bees bowling right there on center everybody had a good time raised a lot of money for the genesee county humane society and it was a, a good time i had by all and i think it was a privilege to be a part of the event so we thank genesee county humane society for welcoming us down there and also want to thank all of our staff and members who came out and helped support and raise money for the animals and you know, with it being cold this time of year, they definitely certainly find dogs more often than not, you know, needing e extra care and shelter and all that. So you guys help provide that. That's awesome. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, that was on top of what we just got done doing over the holiday season. So that's fantastic. You guys are definitely helping out down at the Humane Society with all the, uh, the animals that are in need. Certainly are a lot of them. Another big thing we've been helping out with here in Genesee County, and especially obviously with us being here in Flint, Michigan, uh, we've been helping out with the water. I'm proud to say that our members have been chipping in. We've donated literally tons of water and we're continuing to donate more. If you guys need water, you can get down to the Genesee County Compassion Club right in our front educational center, which is open to the public. You can come in there, talk to the friendly staff, and we'll hook you up with some water. Uh, it's been a privilege to be able to help out. It's unfortunate that we have to do so under the circumstances. But uh, once again, our club members have been helping up to help out in the community. We've even had some of our staff and some of our members, you know, going so far as to take deliveries of water to places that uh, we're not able to get out of the home, apartment complexes. I mean, you guys have really been going over the top and helping out, and it's just amazing to be a part of and get to call myself a part of this compassion club that is really you guys. I mean, you guys make this happen. And the amount of water that you've been putting out is astounding. I know that you're seeing, you know, huge numbers on the TV about how much money people give and stuff. And, you know, we're not rich people by any means, but the amount that we give out is straight from the heart and it shows. I mean, you guys uh, have really been stepping up and I want to say thank you and let your friends and family know. If you need some water, get on down to the club. We want to help you get what you need and uh, help us get through the situation. It's going to be a long one, so we want to continue helping out. If you want to help us make a donation, any donations that you give to the Genesee County Compassion Club that are designated to help out with this water solution or any other charities that we do, 100% of that goes to the charity. We don't take a dime of it. And uh, we just want you to know that your money is going to go where you want it to go. So um, at any rate, it's been great to give out water. We've got more there, so let people know if they need it. All right. Uh, another thing we just got done doing was the soup kitchen. Uh, thank you for those of you that went down and served last Friday at the North End Soup Kitchen, the Catholic Charities, uh, over there on Stewart Street. We've been doing this for a while, and you guys have been keeping it up, and I want to say thank you, and you're doing a fantastic job. Obviously, wintertime is here, and folks need a nice hot meal, and they can always get that right over there on Stewart Street. So if you see somebody in need and they need a hot meal, tell them that's where they can go, or take them there, get them a bus ticket, whatever it is. And uh, we'll be serving again down there at the end of next month here in February. The last Friday of the month is our date. So mark your calendars if you'd like to serve. It only takes a couple hours and always leaves you feeling better when you get done. So uh, another thing, just want to mention, I know it's a ways off, but uh, being that it's cold, we give you guys a little something to think spring, think warmth. And we do have a couple more events, kind of charity events coming up in the spring. Uh, excuse me, in the spring. Um, of course, we've got our Adopt-A-Highway coming up. We'll be cleaning up uh, M13 out there on the edge of Genesee County. 
And then of course our 420 party happening in April. So I'll give you a couple things to think about, hopefully keep you warm as we get through this. And I, I just got done reading, I was a little bit disappointed actually, but there's supposed to be a heat wave coming for the rest of January. So you might be thinking spring sooner than you think. Uh, all right, I wanna talk a little bit about medical marijuana, what's been happening here in Michigan, and also give you a little bit of what's been happening out in the rest of the country. Uh, first of all, our state legislature is back to work in, uh, in, here in Michigan. They're back to you know writing laws, getting them passed and whatnot. And uh, obviously this is the time now that you, if you wanna contact them, you can actually get in contact with them because like I said, they're back to work now. Uh, I wanna point out there's a list of uh, priorities that the legislature put forth already and things that they'd like to tackle in 2016, kind of like their to-do list, if you will. Marijuana is number five on the list. So you can imagine this long list of things that the state legislature wants to take a look at. You know, all of the different issues around the state for an entire year, it's a long list. And marijuana is number five on that list. So I definitely think we're gonna see something occur in 2016 in regards to marijuana. Of course, we've got the legalization ballots out there. We've got abrogate prohibition. We've got MI legalize. There's both still active campaign initiatives to uh, legalize for recreational use. So you've got that going on. And then of course, you've got the set of bills that have still been floating around now for about three years in the state legislature. I'm talking about the distribution center bills, the seed to, seed to sale tracking bill, and of course the edibles bill as they've all be, come to be known at this point. Those are still rolling around and there's still time for input. I think you're gonna see some changes in those and I think you're gonna see them get back to the table for another review. Uh, you know, what I, I'm not sure about is exactly what the process is on that review. I'm hoping that they're gonna go back to uh, a committee, hopefully in the House, uh, and not just in the Senate, but at least in the Senate, I expect to see them back in committee for another review, for more revisements, and then I might even see it up for a vote in front of the State House. It'll probably be a little bit before they start taking votes on bills, but you know, you never know. Um, what, you can't trust a politician, right? But uh, at any rate, I expect to see some action on medical marijuana and marijuana in general in 2016, and especially with it being listed number five on the state's list of priorities here for the Michigan State's legislature 2016 year. Yeah, I think something's gonna be uh, happening. So we wanna keep you in tune this year. We're gonna let you know every step of the way exactly what is happening, how you can be a part of it. And at this point, the most important thing you can do, I think, is be in contact with your local representative and letting them know how you feel, uh, what type of rights you'd like to see protected and what type of advancements or maybe future rights you'd like to have as a patient or a caregiver here in Michigan. So uh, moving on, that's up for the state legislature. I don't have a whole lot else at this point. There's been a lot of different hoopla and talk, but at this point it's just talk. And as I said, the legislature is just getting back to work. So, all right, other things happening for medical marijuana here in Michigan. If you haven't been reading the news, there's a big story going on about a case up in Gaylord, Michigan. This is Otsego County. Uh, this is involving a caregiver uh, who is running a dispensary. And I, I believe the dispensary is called Gaylord Provisions. It's a medical marijuana dispensary. Uh, and the gentleman's name is Alan Witt, who is being charged, and he's facing several marijuana-related charges. Uh, I believe they're all felony offenses is what they're looking at, so pretty serious charges. Uh, one of the charges he's being faced with is for distribution and maintaining a drug operation warehouse or home, whatever. Um, one of the things he was caught with was selling four and a half grams of marijuana in addition to a marijuana brownie to a Michigan patient uh, who is not his patient on his card. So part of the defense here obviously was that the uh, Mr. Witt was conducting himself within the guidelines of the medical marijuana law, i.e. he is a licensed caregiver providing the legal amount to a Michigan patient, which this should be fully com com completely to protected within the Michigan law. Uh, but as you're about to see, it's getting picked apart by our Michigan judges. So uh, I wanna bring this case to your attention and point out a few of the details on today's show about just exactly how is your law getting picked apart inside of our court system? Because since our passage of the medical marijuana law in 2008, there's been an on onslaught of uh, uh, really attacks against the medical marijuana law and the protections that were provided in it. You know, these attacks have just gone on and on to muddy the water, to, to provide 
you know, anything but clarification when it comes to what a patient and a caregiver are allowed to do. And it seems that every time there is a decision, or at least the majority of the time that decisions are handed down from our, uh, you know, court systems, these decisions continue to constrict and restrict the original rights that should have been given or should have been interpreted as given, you know, within our law. And, you know, I'm going to point out this case because it's a good example of the extremities that are going on within our court system and being conducted by our Michigan judges. Uh, you know, not all of our Michigan judges have such a closed mindset when it comes to medical marijuana, but some of them seem to be an extreme representation of uh, what someone should be allowed and, and potentially not allowed to do. So getting on with the case here, we have a Mr. Alan Witt uh, who has a dispensary. He's providing medication to patients. A patient comes in, uh, acquires marijuana from him. He transfers the marijuana to them. They are not his registered patient and this person is an undercover officer. So anyways, the person, Mr. Witt, caregiver, is now charged with a crime, and he's trying to say that he's obviously protected by Michigan medical marijuana law. Seems that he would be. Uh, four and a half grams and a brownie certainly is with less than the two and a half ounces that are uh, allowed by law. Uh, I don't think that's in dispute. The only factor here that they're saying he's breaking the law is because he provided medication to a patient that is not that he is not registered to through Michigan's registry department, i.e. Lara. So at any rate, uh, the defense argued in his case that he should be able to apply Section 8 protections of the law. Uh, and Section 8 protections are pretty wide, and, and basically I'm going to get to you here. It says, based, uh, from Section 8, a person may assert the medical purpose for using marijuana in motion to dismiss a case, and the charges shall be dismissed following an evidentiary hearing where the person shows the elements listed in subsection A, this is a part of the law, the defense has to prove the elements in subsection A, which is a part of section eight, okay? So anyways, these are the elements that you have to be able to prove. And uh, in order to exe you know, exert the protections provided of section eight to yourself in a case. So you're getting into law schematics here. And what section eight is, is it's a section of Michigan medical marijuana law that basically says, if you are a registered card holder, whether you be a patient or a caregiver, and you are allowed to have marijuana and you are allowed to transfer it to another card holding person. So it's, it's pretty general. And it basically says if you're using it for medicinal purposes, there's other added protections inside of section eight that would apply to what a reasonable amount is. So if more than two and a half ounces is needed, there would be protection if someone had to provide that amount to their patient, uh, provided it was for medicinal purposes. So at any rate, that's the way it should have been interpreted. However, this judge is kind of going the opposite way. Anyways, let me get back to what the protections or what the requirements are for meeting Section 8 protections. All right, so the first thing is, is that a physician in their own professional opinion, after completing a full assessment of the patient's medicinal history uh, and current condition made in the course of a bona fide patient physician relationship the patient would likely receive therapeutic or palliative benefit from the medical use of marijuana helping to treat or alleviate certain medical conditions or symptoms so that's the first requirement right there of section eight is that you got to have a doctor make a recommendation and then the doctor has to have a bona fide patient relationship with that patient okay step one step two the patient and the patient's primary caregiver, if any, if any caregiver was involved, that the patient or caregiver was collectively in a possession of a quantity of marijuana that was not more than was, was reasonably necessary to ensure the uninterrupted availability of marijuana for the purpose of treating or alleviating the patient's serious or debilitating medical condition or symptoms of the patient's serious or debilitating medical condition. So section two basically says, that if the patient and the caregiver are collectively in a possession of marijuana that is not more than what is reasonably necessary to provide an uninterrupted supply for treating that patient's medicinal issues, then they should be protected. So pretty simple there. And again, what that is basically saying is that Michigan law already carves out and says, hey, if you're a patient, you can have two and a half ounces. If you're a caregiver, you can also have two and a half ounces. This sentence here, which is a part of the law, is basically saying, look, if they are collectively in a possession of more than what is already being stated, which would be five ounces in that case, that now they would be able to be protected if they had more than that amount, provided as long as it was being used to treat that patient's condition. 
So, I mean, this is a basic right of the law. It was very simply put forth in the law to say for exactly that reason. So, hey, we're trying to provide what? An uninterrupted supply. So let's say, for example, there's a patient who grows his own medication. He grows outdoors. He harvests his medication in the fall when everybody harvests their outdoor plants and subsequently has more than two and a half ounces in his possession that is usable, but he's planning on using that amount until his next harvest comes in the following year. There's a law, a portion of the law carved out for that patient to provide the protection to him if in case when he did his harvest he had more than two and a half ounces. That's exactly what this is for. Pretty simple. That's step two. Step three, the patient and the patient's primary caregiver, if engaged, if any, were engaged in acquiring, possessing, cultivating, manufacturing, using, delivering, transferring, or transporting marijuana or paraphernalia relating to the use of marijuana to treat or alleviate the patient's medical condition or systems. So as long as they were, again, the patient or themselves or the patient along with their caregiver were working to provide relief to that patient's medical condition, then they're allowed to engage in things like acquiring, possessing, cultivating, so on and so forth. So it seems pretty simple that if you're going to have the protections of Section 8, what the protections should be provided for, and also what exactly uh, it requires to get this protection. So you have to be able to prov you know, provide proof that, i.e., yes, you were registered. You have to provide proof that your patient has an actual recommendation from a real relationship with the doctor. You have to be engaging in an act that is helping out the patient. It's for medicinal purposes. I mean, this is all very simple. It seems like, of course, these would be normal things. If you are basically following the rules, then you should be protected. That's what this law is saying. It's not complicated at all. Here's what the judge decided to do after going through this. Uh, and, and mind you that a jury didn't get to hear that at all. It's just the judge who gets to hear this. Uh, the judge goes down and basically says, it is apparent... Uh, that the defense was able to prove the first element that a physician had the opinion that uh, the patient would benefit from medical use. But he failed to prove the, the last two requirements based on Witt's alleged failure to accurately determine what a reasonable amount of marijuana would be for this patient to treat his condition. So according to testimony, Witt supplied four and a half grams of marijuana solely because he had a marijuana card and the amount requested was under the two and a half ounces limited by law. So the patient basically says, look, I came in, I need four and a half ounces. The caregiver says, okay, you can have four and a half, I'm sorry, not ounces, grams, grams. Patient comes in, says, I want four and a half grams. Caregiver says, okay, you can have four and a half grams. They both have cards. Is this for your, you know, you have a card, so it's gonna be for your medicinal condition, of course. But because this caregiver didn't go forth to figure out if that would be an accurate dosage, the judge is saying somehow that that caregiver is no longer able to apply certain protections of the law. Let me, let me say that over again for you. This caregiver, because they didn't determine what the accurate dosage would be, never mind you that the amount they were transferring to the patient was within their legal limits. The judge is saying, well, but because he didn't go back and make sure that that was a reasonable amount for treating their condition, He's not protected by the rest of the law. That, folks, to me, I, I think is it's preposterous. I, I, so the only thing I could tell you is, that according to this judge, you need to make sure every time that a patient either gives medication to themselves or gets medication from a caregiver, that they take time to determine what the accurate dosage should be. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, at any rate, this court case is not done yet. Um, they, they still have yet to go to trial. The attorney for the uh, for Mr. Witt, let's see here uh, if I can get his name for you, Mr. Covert. Uh, he says he's ready for trial. He feels confident Mr. Witt was within the guidelines and he's following every bit of the law and is confident that when a jury hears this, that a jury is going to go, "What? are you kidding me? So he, he was, it'd be, it'd be like, for example, let me give you a metaphor here to explain what this basically is saying. You're driving down the road, you're going 50 miles an hour in a 55 zone. But because you didn't reasonably determine that the speed you were traveling was the accurate speed you should be traveling for the time frame you needed to get to your destination, you're going to get fined. 
John, does it? Does that? Are you? Are you back there? Are you listening? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Does that it? blow your mind? Yeah. I mean, uh, so this person is doing what they're supposed to. They've gotten registered. The other person has as well. They're doing it, uh, you know, according to the law. They're doing it for the right reason. They're doing it within the limits of the law. But the judge says, well, because you didn't actually take time to determine that, you know, that was the right amount, then you're not protected by the law. They're doing anything just to, uh, to just to trip away at or you know trip away at the program, trip away at people's rights, and just it's well, it's incremental, and they think they and they get away with it. You know, they get away with it. I think it's a direct attack on the fact that Mr. Witt was working at a dispensary. Uh, it's something that the local law enforcement up there is pushing because they're they're trying to determine you know how far can they push things and control people's lives and control people on how they're going to do things in their town. Um, you know, from my understanding. There has been no other issues. It's not like this person was caught with something that was over their limit. It's not like they were selling to people who did not have cards. Uh, their business was compliant, was operating you know, within compliance of their township or the city. So this is uh, it's pretty amazing of just exactly how our judges are viewing the law and then how they're conducting their, their court proceedings. I think it's just absolutely amazing. And I hope that this gentleman here has the ability and the opportunity for a jury to hear his case in full without having anything being omitted or deleted from uh, what would be relevant to the court case. So, and, and that has happened in the past. So I hope that doesn't happen in this case. I think it's amazing that he's not gonna be able to assert all of the protections of the law that are given and only be able to assert half of it in a sense because that's what this judge has determined is that he is no longer able to apply the specific protections provided for in section eight and now has to go to a more regimented list of protections, which is in section four. Um, and I, I think a jury needs to hear all of it because this is out of control. Uh, the law was meant to pass people. Uh, it was passed meant to protect people who are doing this for the right reasons, who are doing it within the limits and who are doing it according to the guidelines. Of course, you know, going to the doctor, getting an accurate determination, having a real doctor, uh, a, a real relationship with the doctor, having the right amount, having a caregiver provide to the patient. These are all very simple, basic elements that I think every person who voted on this law understood that they were voting for uh, in order to protect, to no longer go forth and prosecute for these victimless things. I mean, really, how much is the state spending on this case to, to, to try this person for this what? For, for what crime? You know, the, 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 the person who purchased the medication was an undercover officer. So, unbelievable. I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the case. We'll, we'll keep you informed, of course. And hopefully the, the jury, they said it was basically a jury of his peers. Looks like it was half and half as far as men and women. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll, hopefully he'll get a fair trial. I think that justice will prevail. I think it does. So, all right. Uh, I know it's kind of a downer of a case I want to share with you, but I think it's just amazing. And it's something that I think we have to take into consideration and uh, something I want to leave you with this week. You know, 2016 is an election year. And of course, you're going to be blue in the face with who should be president. But, you know, there's going to be a whole lot of other things on the list of that ballot that you're going to be voting for. And I'll tell you one thing that I know I need to personally brush up on is my personal knowledge of who are our judges? Who are they? And who's running to be a judge? And what have they done? You know, and, and you have this thing with judges where they can't be a Republican or they can't say they're a Democrat. And as if that would even help. I mean, we need to be able to determine the judges based on their past character. What have they done? What have they ruled on in the past? If they haven't been a judge, what did they do in the previous job? Were they an attorney? Usually they were. Well, what kind of cases did they take on? How did they work? And it's an extremely in-depth, hard thing to figure out. Uh, I think it's even more tricky than dealing with, you know, who should be governor or who should be president because you get a lot of information on those people and you get a lot of background and maybe it's not necessarily true, but at least you have something to go on. And I think, you know, we need to figure out who are these people that we are voting for. So I would encourage you this year, take a little bit more time when the election time comes around, when you find out who the candidates are, when they finally poke their head up above and say, hey, pick me, let's figure out who they actually are because Judges like this guy, they're determining the livelihood of not just this own person who's being trialed, but really the livelihood of a whole heck of a lot of other people. And, and I think that that's, it's obviously very impactful. 
And it's something that we need to understand that when we are voting for our judges, we are being impactful, even though oftentimes they have no idea what we're doing. So I know I'm guilty of it. I would just encourage you guys, get educated this year. 2016 is a voting year, and it's definitely a big decision. So uh, thanks for joining me this week. This is the Genesee County Compassion Club show. I encourage you to get down to the club. Like I said, if you haven't been there, uh, check it out. And if you need water, you come on down and we'll hook you up. If you need a tasty sandwich, stop by the Holistic Center. It's absolutely smashing. And we just passed inspection, so that's kudos to the ladies over there. You rock. We're still open, and we passed. And uh, that's fantastic. You guys have a fantastic week. Members rule, and have a great year. See you.